teenage years are some of the most confusing years for anyone, especially for Christians. The Black River New Testament Church of God's Teens Ministry, Kingdom Crew, decided to give our teens a voice. And so, we'll bring to you weekly Spiritual Clinic, where we'll ask questions to a member of our congregation that we believe has information that will be useful for our teens. These questions will reveal a lot of real life issues and strong desires to know why or how. As adults, sometimes we ignore these questions and it leads to our detriment, and so we want to assist our teens in leading them in the right direction. We hope to see you this week and the weeks to follow. Welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. I am your host, Joanne Kane, and with us this week, we have Mom Williamson, as she's affectionately called. I'll be reading some questions that our teens have submitted, and we will get our answers from Mom Williamson. Thank you for joining us today, ma'am. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. So to get the ball rolling, I am going to go ahead and start with the first question on my list. And this question is, how do I know what God's will is? And how do I know if I'm called to ministry? That's a very interesting question. And I'm happy to know that our teenagers are interested in knowing God's will for their lives. Psalm 32 and verse 8 tells us, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eyes. Our lives are our own to spend, but we can spend it only once. There are many conflicting voices and different views, but it is possible for us to know what God's will is for our lives. The attitude of one's heart has an important bearing on reception to guidance. If the purpose or objective of finding out God's will is us to decide whether or not you will accept it, it's a losing battle. But to the person who will say, Lord, only reveal thy will and I will avail myself to do, would be the right object, objective and attitude. The call of God upon the life of any person is a great honor and opportunity. A call to Christian work has its basis in the command of the risen Lord, which is known as a great commission. Sometimes we say, I do not feel like I am called. But is a call felt or heard? Every child of God is called to do some form of ministry. Not only our pastor, but once you name the name of the Lord, God expects you to work. Whether at home, as a witness, or on the wider mission field. God is not stereotype. Therefore, he will not call everyone in the same manner. Remember Samuel? Samuel heard God's voice and he thought it was a prophet that was calling. But then he was told, when you hear the voice again, say, speak, Lord, thy servant, hear it. Sometimes our ministers are there as our guide. And there are other times when God calls us like he called Paul. You might not be so sure of your Christian life, but because he has a mark on you, he can speak to you anytime, anywhere, anyhow. He can ask, what will you do for me? But Paul's response was, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? So do not expect God to call you as he called any other. 
but we need to recognize God's voice. And once you can recognize his voice and you are living a prayerful life, you are living in his will, then he will allow you to understand what his call is. Because the minute you accept him as Lord and Savior, it is saying you are called in the family of God. Thank you so much for that. And I especially love the part where you said that, you know, we need to avail ourselves and that in itself will assist us in finding out what his will is and what ministry we'd be called to. Now, our second question, I'm sure, is something that a lot of our teens battle with and it has to do with music. So the question reads, what's wrong with rock or country or jazz music? How can you tell what music is good and what music is bad? Okay. Music, music, music. Even before one accepts the Lord, I think music has been used as an instrument that promotes learning. An instrument or an avenue that would cause somebody to really find their true inner meaning. But so very often, when we come to church, we look and we hear you ought not to do. But the genre of music, or what some people call the style of music, is not necessarily wrong. In order to develop the right attitude to the choice and use of music, let us look at some other questions. Why do we sing or why do we have music? As a child of God, we use music for adoration, to glorify God, to edify believers. And this can be found in 1 Corinthians 14 verse 26. We use music to proclaim the good news of salvation. And so then I ask another question. To whom do we sing? Or to whom do we use music? We use music for God, to each other, and to communicate truth. We use me music for ourselves when we apply certain messages to our hearts. The next question is, what is our manner of singing? We sing with the spirit and music enhances our singing. If you have a beautiful voice and we have music to enhance it, then it makes it more appealing to our listeners. It applies a message that sometimes would never be heard if there was not music. Music with understanding and emotion brings a balance. So then, what about the style or genre of music? The answer is here. This is not based in the Bible. You will not find a scriptural reference. But styles differ according to nations, according to culture, and according to centuries. I remember when I was growing up as a little girl, for us to begin service, we had what we call song service. That was way back then. But in today's church, we have praise and worship because we have evolved and we have praise and worship leaders who lead us and we have good accompaniment to our music. So the genre of music is not sin. It's not sin to play reggae. It's not sin for jazz because music is not the spiritual, but how we apply it. The principle that should guide us here, there's no style that is inherently spiritual. You select your style or you are guided by the culture of the day. Never allow style to dictate the message. Always listen to the lyrics. 
to whom am I giving glory? There should be a balance of style rather than a slavish devotion to a special style. How can I tell what music is good or bad? First of all, one needs to be determined to find the source of the music. To whom will I give glory? We need to understand the function of music in worship. And we need to know how it motivates. Once you have the correct lyrics, once we have the underlying principle, once you know what the culture is for the group, for example, in Jamaica we may have one style, but if you go to Africa or you go to any other country, you might find that the culture is somewhat different. Personal taste is inadequate to guide one's choice of music. Therefore, let us look at the lyrics, the content, and to whom we are sending a message, and we will know whether or not we have chosen correctly. Beautiful answer. And you know, that's something that I think a lot of teens struggle with because music is something that's easily relatable. And for some persons, they don't want to be told constantly, you know, that they're in the wrong. And everyone is individual and so different music will appeal to different persons. So, of course, it's great to know that you're not boxed into one genre. Persons can explore and, you know, find their own uniqueness in music as well. And especially here in Jamaica where... We have a culture where we are stuck somewhat on reggae music. True. So if we can apply this, mu this genre of music to our church worship and know when and how to use it, then it should bring a blessing in what we do. Beautiful. All right. So we are going to go ahead and move on to question three. And this question reads... What do you do if you have parents or siblings who are living the wrong way? And how do you avoid wrong influences when you live with them? Thank you so much, Sister Kane. Parents are our guide. Parents are there to help teenagers make the best of their lives. And especially one, when one accepts the Lord as Savior, you will find that they need to be guided correctly. But if you do not have that influence, you're going to find that you are in trouble. The scripture says, our children too shall serve him, for they shall hear from him as about the wonders. Every parent has a God-given responsibility to their children, to love them, to bring them to Christ, to train them in the correct way, to instill that godly principle, and to allow them not to be misfits in the world, but while serving the Lord, take their rightful place in society. They need to correct them. And as the scripture says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Parents should not then provoke their children. They should not make unholy comments to them. And they should not set bad examples for them. When you do that, or when parents do that, then you're going to leave them confused. Why is it that mommy does this in church, but when she gets home, I see another side of her? We need to ensure that we do not only live our lives as parents in the public, but when we are home, we should be example setters for the children that God has entrusted in our care. So we need to choose, and as the scripture says, choose ye this day 
whom ye will serve. We should not have double standards. We should not say one thing out there, and when we come home, then we live a different life. Parents, if we want future generation to know about God, we need to teach them. If we want them to serve the Lord, we need to be examples for them. Worldly influences are there. And if we do not train them aright, they are going to be depending on their peers. They are going to be depending on their friends who sometimes lead them in the wrong direction. So therefore, we need to ensure that we do not cause greed or lust or riches to lead us astray and have our children see the wrong example being portrayed. Follow the principles of the scripture. And as a young person, as a teenager, with respect, you can speak to your parents. Let them know that having accepted the Lord, there are certain things that you think is not right, and you're expecting them to be good role models for you. They should be your mentors. They should be your confidant. And if as teenagers you are not finding that, I know you will struggle. So with principle, with respect, you can speak to your parents. You have a voice, but let your communication be one that will be respectful. Thank you so much. And I just want to touch on a word that you used earlier. And um, you said that the parents or siblings should not look at the child or, you know, that individual as a misfit, mm -hmm. which is very important for a lot of young persons. Um, they sometimes feel out of place or like they shouldn't say anything because of fear that they'll be labeled. So, again, it is a program for our teens but of course we're hoping to have some adult audiences as well so just a reminder that we need to create a safe space for the teens um, it's a very troubling time for them so um, just listen and be there for them as well and of course parents we want to encourage you to um, not always remind us that it is Practice what I say and not as I do, because of course we're going to look to persons to follow. And I might I add that it's important that the family altar be something that we practice. The, pray, the group that prays together, the family that prays together, stays, stays together. together. And once you can involve your child in a godly environment and you pray together, it will bring about bonding. Amen. All right, so we're going to go ahead and move on to question four, which reads, how do you take a stand with your friends or what do you do when you have a friend that is becoming rebellious? Okay, rebellion. Why is it that people become rebellious? But before I get there, Proverbs Chapter 24 and verse 25 says, But blessings shall be showered on those who rebuke sin fearlessly. And the question is, how do I take a stand with my friend? If I am your friend, I should not be afraid to rebuke you and to rebuke you sharply, especially if you are both Christians, because we expect that our lives should mirror the reflection of Christ. So therefore, most of us I know, or most teenagers, will feel comfortable, will not feel comfortable confronting problems, either with their own peers or their siblings. We hope and feel that if we wait on, this too will pass. But sometimes in our waiting, the problems get worse. So as a Christian, we must not shield wrongs. We need to ensure that if we see something going wrong, 
we talk about it. And if we say someone is our friend, we need to correct them before they slip away. Don't be afraid to stand up for the right. You can help your friend in the spiritual walk, in meekness. You don't have to be so assertive that you sound as if you are quarreling. And in our Jamaican term, we say to cuss them out. But your friend needs help, and you are there as a help for your friend. But we need also to remember that rebellion has many different underlying reasons. Why is it that somebody becomes rebellious? The attitude of every individual is different. But you can help the person to identify what causes rebellion, misunderstandings, peer pressure, problems at home, financial problems, hormone changes, sexual problems. And when you think you're a misfit in any society, then one of the easy way to find yourself out of it is to become rebellious. You become defiant. You don't want anybody to speak to you. And then you find. But if as a friend, you can find the underlying reason, then you can turn to somebody for help. You can turn to your pastor. You can ask your counselor. You can think of a mentor. You can think of your prayer leader or other support groups. When one becomes rebellious, it is telling us that something is definitely not right. And as a friend, you are going to help that person over the hurdle because you want to see that person grow spiritually and you want them to make the best out of their lives. Thank you. If I may ask a question, though, earlier you said um, if you're both Christians, then it shouldn't be a problem for you to rebuke them or to, you know, point out to them that something is happening. Now, in the case of a Christian having a friend that is not a Christian, is the approach different? Not necessarily, but I think it will be easier if the person is a Christian. If the person is not a Christian, because the person is your friend, you have a one-on-one -on -one relationship. So you'll find a way of getting around your friend. Maybe a walk up of coffee, maybe at KFC, maybe going to the beach. You'll find a way where you can say, okay, we're going to have an evening out. And when both of you are together, then you will be able to say, look, man, I notice you have changed a little bit. And you can get into a conversation even without the person realizing that you know that they are rebellious. So the next question that we have reads, why is it so hard to be consistent in the Christian life as a teenager? And since we are looking at teenagers, we need to realize and find out who is a teenager. A teenager, or what we would sometimes call youth, often find challenges in their walk with the Lord, with their Christian life. But you can overcome these challenges. A teenage period is one that I would say, you think you're no longer a child, but you're not yet an adult. So the teenage period probably could be looked on as a bridge. We are crossing over from one area to another. And so, sometimes it's difficult for somebody to correct you. Sometimes teenagers think, oh well, we know it all. The teenage years are years when, that you find you are searching, searching for identity. Who am I? Am I a misfit in this group? 
Or is this really where I belong? Should I be serving the Lord? Am I at the right place? So we search ourselves and we ask questions. It's a time of pressure. We are pressured with schoolwork. We are pressured by our peers. We are pressured into probably sexual acts that you do not really want to go into. You are pressured by family because they have certain standards that they want to uphold. You are pressured by your community, the culture that is around you. And we find that it's a time when people experiment. Teenagers do a lot of experimenting. So therefore, with all of this said, you will notice that living a Christian life, balancing, it's like a balancing act. How do I balance my salvation with all the other things that are happening around me? How do I balance my Christian life with my peers, with my schoolwork? with my parents who are saying, I need you to do this, or with my unsafe friends who are saying, oh, cho, she's just farming, or he's just pretending he's not a Christian. It is a time of physical change in your body, and sometimes with hormones jumping up and down, these biological changes, you find that young people Christians or teenagers hardly know how to respond. When you're crossing over and these hormones become active, you wonder if your life is right before the Lord. Am I really sinning? When I find that I have sexual urges, is it a sin? What is it that is happening to me? But as a teenager, when we learn to identify these things that are happening in our lives and we have the right solution, we go to the right persons for answers, then you find that the challenges will be less. You will find that it is not as hard as you think it should be. So how can I overcome these challenges? Choose your friends wisely. Spend time in prayer and reading God's word. Seek wise counsel and select songs and books and your programs, whether it be the internet or the television, that will help you to get ahead to make you spiritually stronger. In doing so, you will find that the challenges will be there, but they will not be hurdles that you cannot cross over. Thank you. And um, also adding, for me personally, what I can at least relate to is that in your teenage years, it's a time of, I want to say, fitting in, finding acceptance, being ac ac accepted. accepted. <laughs> so it's a time of trying to find acceptance. And so you will look to different groups. So you'll have, you know, probably friends that you either travel to school with or perhaps friends that you knew before because that's, you know, high school years and you have external influences that are taken apart. But what I think a lot of persons fail to let teenagers know is that it's okay sometimes to fail because I think a lot of them have the weight on their heads that, you know, if something goes wrong, then it's all over and done with. So I think that is also important for them to know that even though it is hard to stay consistent in the journey of Christianity, sometimes it's okay to fall down as well. And there's nothing wrong in falling down. But saying there is where the problem is. If we fall, if we make mistakes, we get up, brush ourselves off, say we're sorry. The Lord will forgive. Remember he said 70 times 7. So he is willing and able to forgive us. But oftentimes we find that as teenagers, we do not forgive ourselves. We get in a state of remorse. We think, oh, well, I have failed my parents. I have failed my peers. I have failed my pastor. And so I cannot continue. But let us not take that attitude. Let us brush ourselves off. Get up. There's no harm in falling flat. But don't stay there. Rise above your challenges and circumstances 
and I am sure that in the end, you will make it better. If we're being honest, though, a lot of times the external influences, you just mentioned feeling like you failed your parents or your pastor or your friends. A lot of times those are the influences that make us feel like it is over and done. So again, we're trying to create you know, the safe space for teens, but a lot of them don't have it in whatever environment they're in. And sometimes, you know, Christians as well are too hard on some persons. So I think it's, like you said, a balancing act, but not only for teens, but also for the elders or the older persons that are in and around the society. And, and you're the so group. very right. Because we know we have, especially in a Pentecostal setting, where some Christians think they are so spiritual and so very right that teenagers should not make a mistake. Once you name the name of the Lord, you should be perfect from day one. But if we can remember when Peter denied the Lord, he fell. But when Jesus was resurrected and he was speaking to his disciples, he said, tell Peter too, he's one of us. So we are not going to deny anybody that opportunity to rise again from circumstances. If we make a mistake, there's always another chance. And we serve a God of a second chance. Yes, we most definitely do. All right, so this question is also a question I believe will have a lot of persons' attention. So this question reads, what is appropriate and modest clothing for a Christian and why? That is a question that I think, especially the church of today, we're having a problem. I can remember growing up in church from I was way down there. And in the Pentecostal setting, most times you cannot go anywhere without your head being covered. You cannot go to church without your dress being possible almost down at your ankle. The young men their pants would have to be as the younger generation are calling parachute, where when the wind takes it, it keeps flying. But like I said earlier with music, our dress code has to do somewhat with our culture. We need to ensure that when we attire ourselves, we do so keeping the principle in mind that we are children of the Most High. We are children of God. So therefore, we should not be that revealing that the world will see us as targets. And I often say we should not be walking billboards. We should not be advertising ourselves that people will wonder whether or not. But we should be good examples. So when we think about modest apparel or modest dressing, every child of God should so dress that whether you are coming to church or you are on the street, then you will portray God's image. And I know the early church will tell you that pants is somewhat for men and dresses for ladies. But let us look at it. Here's a young sister in a pair of pants and she's covered down to her ankles. But then another church sister comes and she has on a skirt, but it barely covers you know where. Who will be more modestly dressed? So we cannot think of it as pants being the sin or the skirt being the sin. But what we make of it, some skirts might be too tight or too revealing, some pants the same. 
But as a child of God, we should have high enough neckline and low enough hemline and ensure that once we put ourselves or we are attired to go out there, the world will see us as somebody that they can emulate and not wonder whether or not you are modestly dressed. We're going to ask Mom Williamson to just breathe a word of prayer for our young people, um, just to cover them, guide them. It's a hard time being at home and still having to do lessons. So we're just going to ask that you ask God's blessing on them for the rest of their school time. Okay, can we just bow our heads for prayer? Our Heavenly Father and our God, we thank you for this medium that you have provided that we can reach our teenagers especially. We thank you, Lord, that they can identify with you as Lord and Savior. And Lord, as we have come to the end of this program, I pray, Father, that the questions that bothered their minds would have been addressed. And I pray, Lord, that you will be with them. Whether the challenge is at home or on the street with their peers, at church or wherever they are, I pray, Lord, that you will guide them. And you promise that you will guide them with your eyes. We might not be in the same physical space, but we know, Lord, that you are with them wherever they are. So we ask for your guiding hand. We ask you, Lord, to help them to learn to love you, to read your words, to spend time in prayer, to seek wise counsel, but more than all, to serve you as Lord and Savior. Bless us, Lord, in this endeavor, and help us as we go each day, that through our leaders, our youth leaders, our pastors, and those around that you have called to help them along the way, we will be mentors and guides to them, and they will see us as your instruments that you have set before them. Guide, we pray, and as we close, we ask that you will be with them and let your will be done in their lives in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thank you so much again. And we just want to remind everyone that we'll be here every Saturday. So, of course, we're looking forward to seeing you next Saturday. But before we go, I just want to say on behalf of our host pastor and district overseer, Bishop Whiteley, we want to thank you so much for joining us. Also, on behalf of our elder and officers board, our district youth director, Sister Stella Bennett-Williams, our teen ministry president sister Karine Williamson and of course myself we thank you so much for joining it was a pleasure having you we hope we answered some questions if you have any additional questions you can feel free to reach out to myself sister Williamson and of course we want to thank the Williamson brothers for this beautiful production and we thank them so much for the good work that they have been doing and that they will continue to do for the Lord